Well. Hey, Lindsay. Hi, Moses. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Terror. Um, Terror. Hmm? Terror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I was going to tell the, uh, the folks here that uh, Lindsay Sharp may appear to be a professional museologist, but I've always thought of him as a tightrope walker. Lindsay's uh, academic background is significant. Uh, he actually has a PhD in the history of ideas. I thought how appropriate that you're here today. And that training, of course, uh, predisposes him towards uh, rigorous scholarship. At the same time, uh, the showman in Lindsay knows that uh, having a bunch of artifacts hidden away or displayed in discreet ways for the elite is a waste. And it's about getting the stuff out there, or to put it in the language of the impresario, getting the bums in the seats. seats. Right. So Lindsay uh, walked that tightrope while he was here from, uh, what was it, 1997 to the year 2000. He's now trying to uh, execute the same uh, trick in London, where he is the head of an entire bouquet of museums. And I'm particularly pleased that he agreed to come back to talk to us. Thanks, Moses. Yep. <coughs> now, to see if I can turn this one on, see if I can see what it's going to do for me. Is it going to do anything? Of course, they always go wrong when you need them most, don't they? Hey, here we go. Being the director of a science museum makes me particularly effective at doing this stuff. <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to try to wing it anyway. Oh, good. It's extraordinary. <laughs> OK. <coughs> the origins of uh, Idea City go back to the Roman Forum and to the Greek Agora. And I think it's fair to say that it is a unique and brilliant experience to take part in. It's my second, my first speaking. The fact of life in the modern world is that science and technology is deeply misunderstood. It's deeply frightening very often. It's extraordinarily powerful. It's changing our lives at a rate that is breakneck. It's a series of paradoxes, too. If you think about it, the reality is that about 200 years ago, the scientific and industrial revolution started to take place. Now, I run uh, four museums in, in England that contain the most staggering achievements of science and technology. And when I went there, it became clear that, as Moses said, just actually showing the objects isn't enough. And I realized that there was a couple of paradoxes involved. Right in the middle of the face. That's no good. There we go. Oh, thank you. Another paradox. <laughs> um, and the paradox, the first paradox was this. As we've seen in the last couple of days, it's been absolutely obvious that the, s the power of science and technology now is increasing at, at, at an extraordinary rate. Our ability to control the world apparently is going to be boundless and endless. And yet our ability to control ourselves is also just not there, is it? I mean, we, we face an increasing use of the, the natural resources. We face increasing pollution. We face increasing conflict. The paradox is we can control the world, understand it better, but we can't control ourselves. And think about this. If you've got hundreds of thousands of objects that some of them the greatest beam engines, the first, the first locomotive, and you multiply that revolution, those revolutions, by perhaps one billion or two billion or three billion or four billion people, we can sustain that. I mean, it's sustainable. But you start multiplying it by six, by eight, by ten, by twelve billion. The paradox is we've got this fantastic fecundity and that fecundity and the needs that that fecundity has will destroy ourselves. So I came to realize that, that there had to be a new kind of 
revolution, that museums had to develop new kinds of values. We had to, in effect, start caring more about communicating better with people so that they themselves could start to understand the, the mysteries and, and move through the paradoxes that we have to a new kind of creativity that, that sums up that extraordinary and uses that extraordinary set of abilities that we have. Do you know that the number of potential connections between our neurons are greater than the stars in the known universe? Did you know that? Did you know that under, underpinning that intellectual stuff that we have, you've got the most extraordinary depth of emotion and intuition and creativity, and that it's unique to our species, and yet look what we are doing. And look what's happening, and people can't understand what's going on in their lives. The, the, that, that breakneck speed. Now, before I continue, I, I want to introduce you to somebody who's very special. Someone that, uh, unlike anyone we or, or, or science have seen before, he's come out from England with me, and hopefully he's somewhere, somewhere there in the wings. Mm -hmm. Are you there, Adam? I wonder if you are. Yes. Yes. Well, um, it, it's a bit of a surprise. <laughs> welcome, Thank welcome. Um, I'm so pleased you could make it. I, I guess uh, you'd like to say a few words to uh, the folks. Yes, Is if, that okay? if I may. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, sit, down, sit down if you want. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, right, well, uh, hello everyone. Um, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm very uh, nervous, as you might expect. Um, you might be thinking certain things about me. You might be thinking perhaps he's part of a gay couple, or maybe his wife is unable to have children, and so this man is a surrogate. Well, neither is the case with me. For my partner and myself, it's more a question of... Oh, this is going to sound very brutal, but, it, but it's more a question of, of economics, really. You see, my partner, Jane, uh, she has a very highly paid job in the city of London, and I don't. <laughs> I'm self-employed. I work from home, and uh, well, when we first came to discuss children, I remember it was me that brought the subject up, and she said, look, if anyone's going to have a baby, it's going to be you. <laughs> now, she was joking, but when we really came to think about it, the, the economics, the, the practicalities, it just made more and more sense. Now, the science of the whole thing is, is like this. First of all, one of Jane's eggs was removed and fertilized by one of my sperm in a test tube, just like IVF. And perhaps you remember all the fuss when that first started, people saying you're tampering with nature, you're playing God, remember? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm not sorry. I have read everything that's been said about me. I mean, I have nothing to do except sit around and read. I can't go anywhere. You, you sit here, lie there, take this, you're, you're, you're prodded, you're injected, and I get called out there all sorts of names. I've been poked at, and I have been laughed at, and I have had enough. Right, um, so, <laughs> sorry to, to continue. The, uh, so the, the egg was uh, fertilized. Now, for implantation to take place in my abdominal cavity, which is down here, I have been taking large doses of female hormones. Um, these are for preparation, or if you like, to fool the fetus into thinking that I'm a woman. And obviously, it's uh, changed certain things about me, uh, improved my skin, you can say that. <laughs> and uh, given me other things, like these. <laughs> now, of course, this leads a question. Am I still a man? Because hormonally, I'm somewhere in between. I'm neither male nor female. I suppose I should be called transgender. I still feel like a man. And I still fancy my partner, before any of you ask. Though I do watch a lot of tennis now. 
<laughs> yes, that, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> so, so my body has been prepared to take, to take uh, the embryo. Then an incision is made in my abdomen and the embryo implanted. And then it is a question of waiting. Blood tests, waiting, more blood tests, more waiting, then bingo. Positive. And I felt, well, it's very hard to describe how I felt at that moment. Well, you, you know when you see fireworks go off in, in the night sky, the, the whoosh, explosion, um, and you just can't help but look and say, wow. Well, that's how I felt inside me. After all their tubes, incisions, injections, it was my body that had come through. And so I felt on top of the world. And there is someone here who won't judge me or mock me. I know that. But this is not an easy process. It, the birth is uh, very difficult. There are complications. And, well, to put it plainly to you, I don't have a womb. So when the embryo is implanted into the abdomen, it attaches to and mixes with any living tissue that it comes upon, because all it needs to survive is the blood supply. So this could be the liver, the kidneys, the spleen, the intestines. And this intermixing between the placenta and the host tissue means that they are bonded. So when my baby is born, removal of the placenta could cause massive internal bleeding, large blood vessels may be severed, and the delivery itself, by cesarean, you'll be happy to hear, <laughs> is, is not without its own complications as well. Again, the possibility of large-scale hemorrhaging has to be faced, and I may not live to see my daughter's face. Anyway, as, as I said, I've been reading a lot. So you can imagine the, the press, especially the British press, has been going mad over this. Um, all sorts of opinions, articles, cartoons. Sometimes I check to see I haven't got bolts through my neck. But the pregnancy I'm going through does raise some wider social and moral issues. But to be honest with you, I've read so many different opinions that, that I personally feel very confused as to these wider issues, because this is not the reason why I did this. I want to have a child. It's as simple as that. But I suppose at, at the end of the day, it comes down to this. You're either for or against. Now, those people are against. They say, you're tampering with nature just for the sake of it. You could be raising a next generation who are confused, apathetic, psychotic, who reject their natures. Because if you don't like what you've got, change. Swipe a credit card, pop some pills, and hey, presto, a brave new world, an end to society, they say. Maybe they're right. But on the other hand, those in favor say, a man who can bear a child is a more sensitive being, more in touch with humanity, more caring towards the environment, uh, well, <laughs> a literally more rounded person. <laughs> and these people say that it is time to break down the gender barriers between men and women, and therefore society can progress. We can evolve another step. But the truth of the matter is that nobody knows. But I'll leave that for you to discuss because, uh, well, now all that's important to me is this person who's in here. So thank you for listening. One last thing, though. If you were to ask me, knowing what I know now, was all this worth it? Ask me that again when I hold my baby in my arms. Thank you very much for your time. I, I think the, uh, the time has come for, for Adam to have a lie down properly. <laughs> and I hope uh, that you all wish him very, very well and his baby very well. So, listening to Adam's story, we become aware of uh, both the moral and the scientific implications of 
male pregnancy. Now, you've got feelings about what he's told you. Um, and whether or not you believe that this is a good way to represent science, it, it, it's still a starting point. And we've achieved our goal, which is to encourage the asking of questions and the forming of, of opinions. Now, we know that the public has always feared new science um, technology. Yet having Adam explain the personal implications of being a pregnant man makes the subject uh, one of human interest. And from this we can see that science is complex, but the issues are personal. So th if the issues affect you or someone you know, you you'll feel more interested in the subject, in asking questions, and in expressing or developing an opinion, taking part in the debate. We've seen this in the media when celebrities are sick or, or injured. Now take, for example, Michael J. Fox's uh, battle with, with Parkinson's. That's raised global awareness of the il illness. And few people in Britain knew that David Beckham uh, had a metatarsal bone until he broke it. And now even small children and little old ladies uh, can tell you about where it is and how it works. However, the barrage of shock headlines we are confronted with in our daily newspapers fuel the, the public's fear of science. I mean, try this for size. Mobile phones can cause brain tumors, yeah? Or peanut butter gives you cancer. So all the headlines that, that, that are worrying and reassuring that you've seen earlier in, in, in the show uh, don't help. And there's my personal favorite, which is that the exercise pill answers couch potatoes prayers. One recent scare that made everyone sit up and, and really take notice was flying causes deep vein thrombosis. Remember that one? It's still there, isn't it? And this was a technological issue that threatened how we live and travel. We needed explanations, and once the initial hysteria of the tabloids had died down, we, we sort of got the information we needed, and, and w were then able to make choices about how and if we're going to use this form of transport in the future. Yet, when the public is bombarded daily by conflicting information, there comes a point when they throw their hands up and surrender and say, forget about it. Why bother listening, yeah? According to the media, everything's going to give me cancer, whether it's food or technology or the weather. Uh, I could step out in front of a bus tomorrow and it'll all be over. And then they just say, so I'll just ignore everything. And that takes us back to square one, which is denial. And denial, you all know, is the best friend of fear. So even if the public want answers to their questions, most people don't know how to find out or who to trust. Government or corporate interest in the success of a particular product or the effect that a pressure group has, its actions might have on, on economic activity and stability. Factors like these make the public skeptical uh, about how much of what they're being told is actually true. Most people get their information about science from the media. And while pressure groups talk in those black and white sound bites that reporters relate to, the inability or the refusal of scientists to actually engage with the popular press has allowed science to be worshipped, mystified, demonized. Sometimes all three in the same article. And the public have no source of scientific or technological information that's reliable, independent, or authoritative. And as a consequence, only one side of the story I is being told. And if they're not to be marginalized, it's vital that scientists and science communicators engage effectively with the press and the public. If we could just get that information that we saw yesterday about nanotechnology out there in a way that people understand, wouldn't it help change the world? Now, as Moses said, in the late 1990s, I ran the Royal Ontario Museum, and it's genuinely famous for its collections, its research, natural sciences, ancient civilizations. Every year, the ROM makes astounding discoveries. New archaeological sites, new species, new artifacts are found and analyzed and communicated by curators around Canada and from around the world. In adding to the sum of knowledge, they're making a difference. However, I was puzzled at one thing. Often when a new ecosystem or a new site was discovered, researchers knew that very soon there will be clear felling of the habitat. There will be intrusion by thieves or, or, hordes of, or hordes of tourists. And it seemed to me 
that we had a duty of care that went beyond discovery or collecting to assisting the survival of the habitat or the archaeological site that we'd, we'd explored. I believed then, and I still believe now, that we need to make more of a difference to be proactive to help sustain the ecosystem and to help our audiences understand why this is essential. And that's so that they'll care and help support us in the process. But how can we do this? How can we raise awareness, prompt questions, engage our audiences in circumstances that are very distant from their own lives? How can we add to their social capital, preserve the, the natural capital of the world and still continue in a sustainable way to provide economic capital to improve the quality of our lives? When I arrived in London, it seemed to me, as I surveyed the four museums, the bouquet of museums that, that uh, Moses mentioned, that we had to find new ways to add value to society. We ha had to be supportive of our audiences, help them to learn to live more creative lives, and in creating new methods of stimulating dialogue. To stimulate them to develop their own opinions based on relevant knowledge that was easily found, interactive to their needs, and directly led to dialogue with others. So next year at the Science Museum, we'll take a further step in promoting the public understanding of science by opening the new Dana Center. This will include some of the characteristics of Chum City's DNA. The Dana Center will be the place in the UK where the public and scientists can meet and engage in a dialogue. The place will be informal and politically neutral, with parity of esteem for all, regardless of their education or their social standing. It'll be a place where you can enjoy a really relaxing environment, good food, good drink. It's unique in that its agenda is set not by the scientific community, but by public interest. And we'll use digital and broadcast media to communicate, to stream the audience's points of view out to the public. And our aim is to equip the public with the means to fight their fears and ask questions and come to their own conclusions. It'll be part of a chain, virtual and physical, of immersive experiences, each one uniquely focused on contemporary issues. And we call this the electronic backbone. In June this year, we'll open a visitor center at a nuclear power station. It houses an exhibition called Sparking Reactions. It prompts the audience to question opinions options and outcomes facing us in electricity generation. Data for and against every type of electricity generation is presented in a balanced way. They choose preferred options for power generation, then their choices are fed out to the web and linked by narrowcast through the electronic backbone. I'm very proud to say that the center uses Canadian equipment and Canadian software. There'll be two more interactive elements based in London. One is called Making the Modern World. It's a website that is linked to the greatest examples of the scientific and industrial revolutions. And it's interactive. Another is, is, is a gallery of 100,000 digitized images that is powerfully interactive. Images of our collections and, 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 and of those of, of eight other institutions. In all, there'll be eight vertebrae linked up together in the electronic backbone, and it'll be linked to other science centers and knowledge providers. And Preston, I was listening about the democratic, the idea of a, of a virtual parliament. This would surely work in. So it's our mission to help end ignorance if we can, to help it. We can't make it all by ourselves. By providing the public with the tools they need to ask the questions they want answers to. Questions about how science and technology and medicine affects their everyday lives. We do this because we're passionate about educating the public in the understanding of science. H.G. Wells said that human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe. Since the Industrial Revolution, science and technology have been dictating how we live with brutal momentum. Climate change, surveillance technology, bioterrorism, these are all parts of modern day life. Small wonder then that for so many, science is synonymous with fear. Now I know we don't have all the answers, and I'm here to promote asking questions and to encourage all of you to do the same so that eventually, together, the answers can be found. Thank you.
Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Adam. Will Adam be available for interviews uh, in the lobby? Yes. All right.